Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Arts and Humanities Zoom meeting session. Um, the speakers today are Dr. Bland, Annie, and myself. I'll let everyone quickly introduce themselves and then just we'll start with some questions we have. Please feel free to put any questions that you might have about arts and humanities, being a student, um, any of the arts and humanities programs in general into the chat. And we would love to answer those throughout the session today. So just to kind of kick off the introduction, my name is Alexandra. I graduated this past spring with a philosophy degree, so very exciting. Um, hopefully some of you will be interested in philosophy, um, but I'm also a recruitment officer, so um, I can answer any questions you have regarding admissions or um, student experience or anything like that. And I will pass it on to Annie. Hi everyone, my name is Annie and I'm currently in fourth year, which is crazy to think, and I am studying French and political science here at Huron. And I'm really happy to have you all here today. Happy we were able to host this session. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Steve Bland. I am uh, a professor in the philosophy department and the chair of the philosophy department. So I'm uh, excited to, to tell you a little bit about what we do and uh, answer any questions you have today. So throughout the time what we're going to be talking, please, like I said, again, feel free to drop your questions into the chat. You can direct message me and I'll ask those. But just to kind of start the conversation in general, um, I wanted to ask the, a quick question to kind of get us started. And why study arts at Huron and specifically over any other university, why Huron would be a great place to study the arts? I can uh, take that first if that's okay, Dr. Bland. Um, I was extremely interested in studying the arts at Huron, especially because of the small class size, which I think is very advantageous for an arts based education, because you know you're not sitting in a lecture hall of 500 people, you're in a very close knit kind of group of individuals and you're able to have a lot of discussion, a lot of perspectives, like varied perspectives being shared in class. And because you're in that kind of small class setting, it really teaches you to be able to articulate your ideas and your thoughts on a certain subject, which, you know, sometimes in a larger kind of lecture setting at a larger institution, you'll never get that opportunity, but it's very good to have that kind of uh, experience in an arts-based degree. Um, and particular for me, um, if any of you are interested in the languages, like having that small class size and being able to speak French, you know, get a lot of that oral practice is super helpful and something you may not get anywhere else. Yeah, the, the way to think about the arts maybe is, um, it's, it's an alternative to traditional vocational training, right, that what we used to do is prepare for a single job, a single career path. And that in, in the old labor market decades ago, that made perfect sense, because you would tend to stay in one career path for your professional life. That's not really the case anymore, right? You can expect to change jobs and change areas, change careers multiple times throughout your working life. And so one strategy for preparing yourself is to try and get a really robust set of skills, right? A set of skills that you can apply anywhere, anytime, that's going to be useful in any position. So things like critical thinking, examining presuppositions, um, uh, argument, communication, right? Both, both oral and written. All of these things are really, really important. They're transferable across domains. And also they're very, very difficult to teach. And so when you're when a prospective employer is looking at someone to hire, um, they, they want to be able to impart skills quickly and efficiently. You can do that if you're training someone on a software program. You cannot do that with the, the, the kind of soft skills of communication, argumentation, rhetoric, these kinds of things, the kinds of things that you would learn in an arts education, right? It takes four years to really hone your craft. But then you have a set of skills that um, people recognize are difficult to, to get in the first place, can't be trained easily, and apply across all different domains. So you're really setting yourself up for success across different areas, across different careers, and giving yourself options that you wouldn't have otherwise with more kind of narrowly specialized training. The reason to do it at, at Huron um, or, or somewhere like Huron, again, as Annie said, it, it, it's small. There, we have no graduate students, which means our attention as faculty is undivided. It is 100% on undergraduate students. 
So instead of teaching 40% of the time to graduate students who are doing PhDs, who take up most of a faculty member's time, believe me, right? We spend all of our time with undergraduates in smaller classes so that we, we get to know them year over year and get to understand how they learn and we get to communicate with them and learn their learning style and also incorporate their learning into our research. Research learning is a really big priority at Huron. So um, it's not unusual for students to work with faculty on research projects, which again is a huge opportunity that you really can't get anywhere else. I'll actually just second what Dr. Bland said about the kind of relationships you're able to build with your professors, which is, as he said, extremely unique and all of their attention and focus is dedicated towards you and your success and the professors here are very heavily invested in your success and they will do what they can to help you out and as you said like you get access to opportunities that you would not get at a larger institution where potentially that professor student relationship is like a bit more farther away um you can really you know get research opportunities and develop like really strong reference letters and all that kind of thing that sets you up for a very successful future in a wide variety of industries. Awesome, thank you. So my next question is, is there flexibility to combine different programs at Huron? I can take this one too. Uh, yes, there is definitely flexibility to combine programs. I myself, I'm doing a double major. Um, there's a lot of options to do a major and a minor a major and a double minor, um, you can also, you know, you're not restricted um, to only take courses within your program too. You have a certain amount of electives that you can take. So you can kind of pick and choose from a wide variety of subjects. I certainly, even while pursuing a double major, have been able to kind of indulge in a lot of different courses throughout different faculties um, and departments, which has been really valuable to me because I kind of get, as Dr. Blaine was saying, that like broad and well-rounded experience of educating myself in a you know, multiple lenses through different kind of schools of thought in different programs and whatnot. So there's a lot of flexibility for you and you definitely don't have to kind of focus your interests only in one, uh, you know, field and completely ignore any other interests you may have. Um, you can definitely get a wide variety of courses. Yeah, and I think it's a good idea to do it. I mean, as I said, the 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 way the labor market is working now, um, flexibility is the key, right? The idea that you have to have skills that apply across domains. And so the advantage of doing a dual degree is that you get skills in, in two different, not just two different disciplines, but two entirely different areas, for example. So increasingly we're seeing students who are majoring in um, e either um, business or, some um, social science and an art, right? So if you are say um, a history and psychology double major, the advantages are enormous because on the psychology side, you learn uh, methods of quantitative reasoning and statistics, skills that are in high demand, but also on, on the history side, you learn how to um, look into, you do the, the qualitative side of research. Right, so you're you're looking at documents. You're you're looking at the difference between primary sources and secondary sources. You're doing archival research, right? And so th these kinds of skills, learning, knowing where to look for information, how to acquire the information, and how to analyze the information, right? If you can do that across a couple of different disciplines, then you're in a really good situation. Um, when, when it comes time to graduate, when, you, when it comes time to apply these skills elsewhere. So I, I would encourage, not only do, do we admit of um, double majors, but we encourage it. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more of them, which I think is a very, very good thing uh, for our students. And I will say I have found being in a double major very manageable for myself. And like I said, even while doing the courses that I'm required to take for those majors, I have been able to find some very fun and interesting electives and, you know, combining 
this kind of programs really does give you a very strong foundation when you're heading out and graduating because I mean I'm a strong arts and social science person kind of all the way but I will 100% use the knowledge I learned in my first year business course in my future endeavors so you definitely are encouraged to uh, take courses across a, a wide variety of disciplines for sure. And to add on to that question do you have to declare your major or program in your first year? No, you don't actually, which I think is really valuable because the first year is kind of taken as an introductory year where you get exposed to many different types of courses and programs and you get to take a lot of the introductory courses. So you kind of can see where your interests lie, what you like, how you like to learn, things like that. And then you can um, declare from there at the end of your first year. And of course, you're able to switch it up if you want to. So. I find that really, uh, really important, especially, you know, sometimes coming in from grade 12, you don't exactly know where you want to be, what you want to do. And so having that kind of general first year is very helpful. Yeah, I, I think you should wait the, the year to figure out what you want to take. I think a good idea is to try and take as much as you can and then do what you really enjoy and what you're good at. If, if you can hit those two areas, right? Find something you really like to do and something you're good at, pursue that, right? Because that way you're not only going to enjoy your degree, but you're going to get skills that you want, right? You're, you're going to get, you're going to put yourself in a position for a job, a career that you can be really enthusiastic about, that you can really enjoy. And so in my first year of university, a long, long time ago, uh, I went in thinking that environmental science was the way to go, that, that, that I was convinced that was going to be my major. And it took me one week to determine that that's not going to happen. Uh, it was just painfully boring, not objectively, but for me, it was terrible. I hated it. And so I switched majors several times, right, trying to find that thing, trying to find that fit. Because the thing is, it's such an important decision. You are setting yourself up for the rest of your life, right? You're making decisions now for your trajectory later on. And so not only do you wanna give yourself the most options that you possibly can, but you also want to give yourself options that you're going to enjoy, right? You don't want a job that you hate for 40 years. Set yourself up, not only for professional success, but for fulfillment. And so the idea that you can go at eight, 17 or 18 years old, know exactly what you want to study and take exactly the courses in your first year that you need to is ridiculous, frankly. So take as many as you can, figure out what you like, be flexible, and then tailor your courses to your interests, right? So in, in the case of philosophy, for example, we have four first year courses. They're all fairly broad. But if you want to take a more specific, a more targeted course, you've taken philosophy in the past, you can take a second level course. There, there are no first year pr prerequisites. You can take a, a, any course from 200 to 2200 without having taken a first year course. If you want to take something more specific in the philosophy of religion or um, the business ethics or something like that, you want to focus on that rather than taking a broader first year course, do that, right? Take as many courses as you think will interest you, find the one that interests you most, and just chase that down. Chase your interests down. That's your job for the next four years. And then on that note, are there any unique courses or opportunities that we offer here on students that they would want to take advantage of to explore their interests and learn more about them? So many actually. And you know, like course variety searches up every year. We get a lot of exciting new opportunities going on. Um, in terms of courses that I've been able to participate in that I found really interesting and exciting to be honest with you. Um, I was able to uh, be in the experiential learning course, um, Peace Building and Reconciliation in Post-Genocide Rwanda, which is a poli-sci course, political science course. And we actually were able to um, go to Rwanda. This was, of course, pre all the things going on. Um, and we were engaging in kind of on the ground absorption of knowledge and experience that, you know, goes far beyond the textbook, right? And far beyond the readings that we had been preparing. You were able to see exactly like what you had been learning about in person, which I think was 
extremely valuable to me and really like no experience I'd ever had before. Um, and also, you know, within every program, there are fun and exciting courses that you can take. Uh, I was in a course on French food and culture the other year, and we were able to kind of learn about different styles of cooking and even do some cooking in class. So you'll definitely be able to find something that interests you. And, you know, the more you look and dig into kind of not only the course selection, but what you yourself find engaging and interesting, you'll be able to, as Dr. Blant said, kind of follow a path that can really suit you for sure. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a course of my own, not because I think it's the best in our department, but because that's what I know best uh, since I offer it. Um, but the course I would just highlight for your consideration anyways is my first year critical thinking and reasoning course and the and the reason i would put it forward as an interesting course is because it speaks to what i have been talking about thus far right the the idea is it's supposed to make you a better thinker by giving you tools and skills and knowledge that help you recognize um where not just you as a person but human beings generally tend to make mistakes in the way that they reason right and so um, we're much better dealing with reasoning about concrete things than about abstract things. We don't deal particularly well with statistics. Um, we're not very good at reconstructing arguments. And so this is a course that's meant to, to help you improve the way that you think by giving you tools, concepts from a bunch of different disciplines, economics, psychology, philosophy. Um, and so, um, it's, but it's also meant to help you think about how you think generally, right? So how to, how to create a better atmosphere for the way in which you think, right? Because you can't just ratchet up your own thinking through instruction. Part of what, what we're doing is trying to show you how to create a setting in which you can better think, right? So that the, all the onus isn't on you. You can find out the, the people, the groups, the environments in which you can thrive. And so it's a it's kind of a multidisciplinary course that looks at uh, techniques that all that all of the disciplines use, both in the social sciences and the arts, but also we we talk about scientific reasoning more generally and controlled experiments and randomized trials and things like that, and understanding the rationale behind the scientific method and how we can appropriate some of that in our own lives, right? And so it's a very multidisciplinary course. That's not for philosophy students specifically, it's meant to give you skills that you can apply no matter what you go on to do in your academic career and professional lives. Um, so that, that would be the course that I highlight, again, because it's the course that I enjoy most and I'm most proud of, uh, and I know it best. Thank you. And then our final question I'm going to ask, and then I'll move on to questions that um, people have given me in the chat, but what can you do with an arts degree once you do graduate? What can't you do with an arts degree once you graduate? It sounds silly when I say it, but it's it's true because you know you do learn those transferable skills that can be applied across disciplines, across fields, and that are in extremely high demand. Um, especially when you think about critical thinking and kind of a more empathetic kind of based education. Employers really want people who can communicate, who can, you know, work together in a team, who can articulate their ideas clearly and, you know, efficiently. And that's the kind of education you will get in an arts-based degree, and you'll be able to apply that to any kind of employment you have in the future. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've been teaching for quite some time now. Uh, so I have lots and lots of students who have who have come through my courses and, and our programs um, and they range. I mean, the, the 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 range of careers is really astonishing. So when you think of philosophy, you might think of law. Right. So if you, if you improve the way that you argue and you speak, that's really valuable um, for a profession, for a, for a legal legal career. And indeed, we have lots of students. Um, who are in law school and who are now very successful lawyers. Um, but, you know, in, a, in another branch of justice, I have students who have been, um, who, who are now police officers. I have students who are entrepreneurs. I have students who are policy analysts. Uh, and so, you know, it, it just, there's an enormous range 
Um, the, the people that I went to graduate school with who also have philosophy degrees, who have advanced degrees um, in masters and PhDs, I'm the only one uh, who's in academia of the, the eight or nine people that, that I was really close to. Everyone else is doing something else. And uh, I think I probably earned the least amount out of all of us, frankly. Uh, they're, they're doing, they're absolutely thriving, right? And so they've taken this philosophy degree and uh, my closest friend has turned it into a consulting firm um, that who I've, and I've done some work with, with him, right? Going into businesses and teaching them how to think better and to think collectively, right? And so there really is virtually no limit. What you want to do is you want to get the, the global skills of, of philosophy that are transferable across domains and then figure out, okay, what area do I want to work in? And then marry those two things, take those skills into that discipline. But there's no limit to the, the areas or the vocations that you can bring it into. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, like I said, have a philosophy degree and I'm in recruitment and admissions. So that has nothing really to do with what I actually learned in class, but definitely a lot of transferable skills that have helped me in my current job. So um, there's a tidbit of experience from my here on education where I am now. Um, so questions that people have given in the chat, I'm going to read through now. Um, is there a lot of diversity among the students and faculty in terms of economic and social backgrounds? Yeah, so um, there is, and it's, the, the nice thing is it's increasing over time. So this administration is particularly dedicated to, um, to increasing diversity on campus. Uh, in fact, the, the president has uh, himself personally donated hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, scholarships for students who otherwise wouldn't be able to be at Huron. So we have increased those scholarships. We've increased the number of students um, from various backgrounds who, for whatever reason, wouldn't otherwise be able to have this opportunity. Um, in, in terms of kind of socio-cultural diversity, um, we have a large number of international students. I believe it's about a, a third of our student population, a quarter to a third of our student population. Again, from all different backgrounds, from all different parts of the world, uh, and frankly, I, I as, a, as a faculty member, really enjoy, I appreciate the diversity in my classroom because it brings all different perspectives um, it, it, into the class on any given issue that we talk about. So there, there, is, there is a lot of diversity right now. It is only increasing. We're getting more students from India, more students from Africa. And this, in my eyes, is a is a really, really wonderful thing. I'm, I couldn't be happier about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely second what Dr. Bland said. There's a lot of uh, diversity at Huron that it's only increasing over time. And it's really been wonderful to see even in my past four years, you know, you've you've kind of noticed that a lot. Thank you. And then what are what are all the things that will be incorporated um, into, for example, a history degree or in the department? Can you think of anything that's super interesting that can combine different types of um, aspects from different programs in general? Yeah, the, I mean, the history program is one of our best, uh, if I'm being perfectly honest. I mean, I really admire the, the, uh, the history program. They are multidisciplinary. So um, they, they work, they do a lot of travel. Um, they have connections, multiple connections with um, England and uh, also with schools in the States. Um, so there has been a lot of travel. Of course, that travel has been restricted lately, um, but even local travel, they have a, a connection with Chatham. Multiple different faculty members um, study the history of uh, slavery in Canada. There's a lot of local history, but there is also kind of connections all over the world. Again, you learn archival techniques. So in fact, I'm a history, I was a history minor when, uh, again, long ago when I was an undergraduate, philosophy major, history minor. The degree you would get here, the experience you would get here, I can say, is so much better than the institution that I graduated from, Trent University. Um, it's, it's incomparable. The amount of experiential learning in that discipline, in that program, is awesome. You can travel to England. You can go to the States, uh, you travel around Ontario, 
Um, you, there are indigenous communities that are, uh, that cooperate with a lot of our faculty members. Um, there is a letterpress project. So an ancient, not ancient, but an, a hundreds of years old letterpress that there is now a project of restoring it and using it as a, a way of teaching students. You, you will learn how to do archival research, which I never learned in the four years of my program. You will go to archives looking for specific information, right? And learn how to engage primary sources rather than just secondary sources. It's an incredible program. I cannot recommend highly enough. Thank you. And then what are the typical class sizes of, for example, an arts or social science first year and upper year course? program? Um, that too is changing. So it used to be, um, when I first started teaching at Huron about 15 years ago, the, the average uh, first year class um, would, my first year class would be 110 students. Uh, that went down to 90, uh, it, then to 80. This year is 75. And the cap, that, that is to say, the, the maximum that you will have next year will be 70 in a course. Uh, that's, that's the absolute max. Some courses have much fewer than that. So again, the history first year classes, uh, I believe are, are capped at 45 and will be capped at 40 next year. So again, smaller courses. Uh, I taught across the road at Western for several years before I came to Huron. I taught the one of the first year philosophy classes um, and my classes on average, uh, and again, this is 15 years ago, uh, we're about 500 students. I had a team of TAs who taught all of my seminars. I only went in for the lecture. I knew none of my students. Uh, they, they were gigantic and they've only gotten bigger. Uh, we're getting smaller every year. So our first year classes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The administration is making them smaller to create that more kind of intimate um, atmosphere between students and faculty. In the lot. Oh, sorry, Annie, did you want to say anything? That's okay. I could just uh, sneak in a little a personal experience here. Yeah, the class sizes at Huron are part of the reason why I chose to attend the school. And because I really kind of was interested in that sort of intimate learning experience that Dr. Bland was speaking about. And I've had French classes, you know, where there's about 10 students in the class. And that's extremely beneficial in a language based program because you do get a lot of chance to practice your communication skills and really improve your spoken French in my case. So it's a it's a really uh, unique and advantage advantageous uh, thing to have is those small class sizes. Awesome. Okay. Well, those are all the questions that really came in today. So thank you so much for participating and asking those questions and hopefully you gain more insight. I just wanted to mention that um, you can sign on tomorrow again for tomorrow's session. And we didn't touch on the Center for Global Studies because that's in the social science um, session tomorrow. So please feel free to log on and you can learn more about that tomorrow. And if you don't have any other questions, we are going to end the call here. I have left my email in the chat. So if you have any questions, um, you can email me directly and we have a tour beginning as well. So you can pop into that starting now. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the open house. <laughs>